down in a ballpark someplace right now, Brent. It is the Blue Jays, air quotes, home opener. Yes. In uh, Dunedin, 7 o'clock first pitch tonight on Sportsnet 590. The fan at Sportsnet, Shohei Otani. Is that Shohei Otani and the Los Angeles Angels? I just want to say that because I, in previous years it would have been Mike Trout and the Los Angeles Angels. But now the best show in turf is Shohei Otani. Uh, Shohei Otani and the Los Angeles Angels taking on the Blue Jays in front of, <coughs> pardon me, I believe now 1,900 people. Lucky, those lucky dogs. 1,900 folks in Dunedin, uh, which is actually not that far off, frankly, from what the average crowd would be at a Rays game down the road. I'm sorry, that's just... Uh, would have been a lovely day for baseball here. A little chilly, but I'm sure the roof would have been closed anyway, right? Roof would have been closed. Folks would be down there already. Probably doing the show from down there. Yep. Yeah. Maybe. Well, so how many opening days are there going to be this year? I'm thinking there's going to be three. Oh, three home openers. Yeah, there'll be the Buffalo home opener. Yep. And I choose to be optimistic that Me there too. will be a third one here in the fall. Me too. Like, why not? Like, what, what's what's the price of optimism? There's no point. At, at, this, point, there's, at, at this point, there's no reason not to be optimistic. Because, yeah. Just because. Yeah, just because, <laughs> right? Just like, cause. why not? I... I just cause. Yeah, just cause. That's, so so let's let's hope for a you know Labor Day home opener or something along those lines. Yeah, that's, that's that'd be fine. That's kind of where I'd, Labor Day'd be all right. Labor Day would be fine. Canada Day'd be better, but Labor Day Labor Day home opener uh, would be fine. It uh, it is. I don't. I was I was thinking about this driving in. I was trying to think which. This seems stranger to me than last year because last year everything was kind of. Yeah, kaput, right? Kaput, and yeah. and everybody was, we're all making this up as we went along, right? Yeah, we were waiting last year at this time. I mean, we're, we're still in the process of waiting for the daily COVID test to see who was or wasn't going to be, uh, who was or wasn't going to be in the lineup. This one, though, feels different because of the fact we've seen games played in front of fans. Like, I, I cannot tell you how odd it was to see all those people in, in Texas. That that was, it. It took a lot of getting used to. Yeah, even the even the less than full house yeah. yesterday, right? I Just, wasn't uncomfortable with it, and I, you know, like some people, I didn't sit there and keep mental track of who was wearing masks or not because those folks can all run out and get vaccinated this morning. That's so that's correct. I, I've checked my smugness at the door a long time ago, but it was, yeah, it was a little, yeah, it was a little different and this i think tonight tonight is going to seem even stranger to me than what we saw last year yeah because last year it was just just get the get the damn game going well last year of course you know we when the summer thing happened we didn't know you know where they were talking about them playing at pittsburgh and maybe or maybe playing at the trop and you know then it finally kind of settled on buffalo and things were already rolling by then and um yeah the mood like everything's the moods the mood changed i i i Forgive me for not knowing who wrote the column in the Globe. We're forgetting who wrote the column in the Globe today. But there was a, there was an interesting piece about the kind of the moods of the three different lockdowns. You know, the first one was fear, second one was frustration. Mm-hmm. This one's anger. Yeah, I think that's right, and I, I think it's, it's. I thought that was bang on. That right? is exactly right. People are just mad right now, and they're not even sure to be mad at. But there's lots of <laughs> there's lots of options, uh, and but and watching things unfold at arm's length from us in uh, Robin Urban. Who is it, uh, Derek? Oh, Robin Urbach wrote that column, really, which is a really, it was a really, a really good take on it, I thought. But, um, yes, for us watching things unfold at more than arm's length in a sort of normal way and pining for them, but maybe not pining for them because we're still kind of scared. Yeah, it is, it, it's, I, it, every one of the uh, things I've felt over the last 12 months have been different than anything I've ever felt before. So just add it to the list. Yeah, this, uh, that, that's a perfect, I think, explanation of, uh, of sort of how, um, how this how this is going to feel and uh you know especially we we just had bill ripkin on baseball central he was talking about you know i feel bad for people in toronto not being able to see this young team because mm-hmm. like a lot of people in baseball he's all in on the youth of this team you know they're not predicting they're going to win a world series or anything but like a lot of people um he's obviously all in on, on Bo and vladdy and it seems really odd to 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 think that um there is a chance, at least. You know, think about this. There's a chance that we don't, we will not have seen Bo Bichette 
play a game in Toronto until he qualifies for arbitration. I mean, <laughs> he, he's now he was there a couple of years ago, yeah. so it's not like we haven't seen him, but we're going to see, you know, well, we're, we're going to see him, uh, the bulk of his arbitration pre-arb years are probably going to well, pass in other cities. We're only going to see the back half of the Ryu contract potentially, <laughs> right? Like, right. like take, take, your, take your pick here, right? Uh, <laughs> like you, you kind of forget that these guys haven't set foot That's here. true. You know, some of them. And uh, I hadn't thought of the Ryu contract. Yeah, two, two years out of four, right? So, um, like, I, uh, I, I will say I've learned, I've learned how to watch sports in this environment. I, I'm enjoying, I can enjoy it, right? Like, I, I will say that. Like, I, I enjoyed the hockey game last night. I know there's no fans there. I didn't spend any time thinking about, boy, wouldn't this have been better with a crowd? When the Go Leafs go, the fake Go Leafs go chant started, it didn't f- make me feel one thing or another. I just kind of enjoyed it. And I've, and I've really enjoyed watching baseball to start the season. I've watched a ton of it. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm quite happy to kind of surrender myself to it, in, even in the weird circumstances. But I, I, yeah, I do pine for the day. I, I don't know what it's going to feel like when they come back. You know, I think it's like euphoria, I think. Um, maybe a little bit of trepidation uh, mixed in with euphoria. But uh, sooner, I hope sooner rather than later. And it's it, like this, when, what, however we track the, this incarnation of the Blue Jays team, Blair, you know, this this will be part of that story, right? That, yep. uh, you know, that the the early, the, you know, the kind of early days of this team heading towards whatever they're heading for were played out thousands of miles away. Yes. Um, yeah, it is. It, it's, you know, I was thinking about last night's hockey game. We will be joined, by the way, by Felix Potvin later on in the show. Of course, the goaltender who Jack Campbell uh Record was broken by Jack Campbell. Jack Campbell's turned into one of the one of the really, really, really good sports stories of this, at least for me, of this of, of this um, of this pandemic. But you know, you mentioned the fake crowd noise and everything. Yeah, you know, I, I I hated it. Like when it first started out, you know, I would go out of my way. Like I, I'd watch soccer and I'd watch the stadium sound thing because yeah. I didn't want the fake noise. The you know, two point five seconds behind the goal scoring, the, the crowd cheering. And now I just don't care. You know, the fake noise would really piss me off, and I, I hate this. And now it's just, I'm just watching it. I don't yeah, care. I'm just, just watching and enjoying stuff. And all the all the stuff that was kind of bothering me, nah, I just don't. It's just not a factor anymore. Just enjoying it. Just yeah, just just watch it. I like. And again, I thought that was great entertainment last night. I I hope that's I hope that's the first round. Oh, I do too. I think it'd be a great first round yeah, for the Leafs. I hope it's the first round matchup too because. Well, it won't be easy, man. That's a, you know, like, like I, with, we'll see with Brendan Gallagher comes back and when he comes back, but that, that was a really interesting game last night, the ebb and flow of that hockey game. But again, you know what? I, I don't, and we'll talk to Ren Lavoie about this when he joins us. I don't know if I can remember a Leafs team because I wasn't as, as invested in them back the last time they were good because you know, yeah. I was covering, I was spending more time covering, covering baseball and I wasn't particularly paying attention I don't know if I have seen a Leafs team, you know, since I'm going to say since 2000, where I just assume that they are going to win. I, I am not surprised when they win. Doesn't matter how the game goes. Doesn't matter what the flow of the game is. Doesn't matter what the shots and just it, it doesn't matter. I just assume that they will figure out a way to win and it may not be flashy. It may just be nights where they outgrind the other team, if that's such a word. I haven't seen a Leafs team like this. I, I just, I have not seen a Leafs team that is capable of winning games in a bunch of different ways and really doing so in a manner where at the end of the night you look at it and go, yeah, it makes sense. Yep. They don't have to be, they, they, it doesn't have to be their best night for them to no, win. it doesn't have sure. to be 7-6. And that's important. Or 7-2. Uh, you know, they've matter. kind of, I say they righted the ship. You know, they had that, after the Edmonton series where they looked like the best team in the world, their Edmonton games where they looked like the best team in the world. They, you know, obviously they struggled a bit. But, you, you're, and these games, some of these games aren't spectacular. You know, the Calgary game wasn't spectacular, but nope. they won. And, yeah, last night, the second period, the Habs were all over them. Um, really, you know, really had, you know, kind of pushed them back. And Campbell was really good. But you you know you watch them kind of assert themselves in that third period, and I know you know it was close at the end with the empty net, the goal or the goal scored with the with the with the goalie pulled by the Habs and made it kind of interesting. But you know really, Leafs owned that third period, and it it you know heading into the trade deadline, 
I, I, I'm not sure you desperately need to do anything. Like, they, there's a lot of bodies there at forward. I, like, you, sure, I'm sure you could find somebody that will make you better or deeper, but the way they cycle guys in and out, you know, a lot of guys played well. They didn't have Nylander last night. But, you know, a bunch of other guys played well. You, you know, you saw flashes from, it's not just the top three guys, but, you know, man, the top three guys. That, the goal, the, uh, the, the Hyman goal in the rush, you know, from, from their own crease. Matthew's taking the, the puck in their own crease. And scoring off the rush on that goal, you know, that's special. Yeah. You know, it's special. When those I guys just, are going, it's special. I, I just think that he has the, – the, the elements he has added to his game. You know, Austin Matthews is always going to be a flashpoint for a lot of people around the country. I mean, if you're the best player in the Toronto Maple Leafs, you just – you can take for granted that half the country is probably going to hate you. But I, I would be – it would be interesting to pull a hundred Leafs fans into this room and say, when Austin Matthews was drafted and signed, and we we're making this big, this fuss about him, did you think that he would turn into the type of player he is now? Not a great player, but the type of player who would make a play like that. Three years ago, like, do you think that do you think that Mike Babcock must just look at some of those plays and go, Jesus? Like three years ago, do you think we'd be talking about Austin Matthews going behind his net, beating two guys to the puck, coming right out, yeah, and 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 leading the rush? There's a, he is a more complete player than I think most people thought he would. So be. yeah, but so is Mitchell Marner, right? Like again, I'm not comparing. Like, and they're very different players, right? But I yeah, they uh, you know both of these guys. You know, even when you pick guys really high, mm-hmm. we, there's a long list of guys who flamed out, right? The top three <laughs> picks, top overall picks, guys who flamed out for a bunch of reasons, never reached the kind of levels that. People thought they were. You got to. So you want that pick in a year when you know when it's Connor McDavid or when it's Austin Matthews, but there are a bunch of other kind of can't miss guys who missed. So right. you know that's the first part. You know, but yeah, I I think he has, you know, answered every prayer, Matthews. Right? Like he's you know he because because he's a complete hockey player. He's he is you know all the cliches apply. He, he plays in his own end. He uses his size and his strength. He's still got elite skill. He scored. I, I'm still not convinced he's, his wrist is 100 percent healthy. No. But I don't even. It, but he's I, finding a way, right? Yes, I, I was because I'm. I don't think it is. Doesn't look to me like it. Uh, I, you know, I, I haven't seen that that shot that I'm used to seeing. But I'm still seeing him. Yep. He is not. He has not disappeared because of a wrist injury. Yeah, I, I, I just can't. I know. I hate. It sounds like you're always singing the praises of the guy, but I, I just think that. I think because there, he was so highly touted coming in, coming into this thing that we've we've forgotten how much work it must have taken for him to get to the the level he is now and to play the type of game he plays. Yeah, right now. Yeah, no, like that. That no, it does require commitment because he, you know, again, he could be an offense only player and yeah. still be a, a superstar in the NHL. But you know, he's no, he's put a lot into it. And again, I same as, but I feel the same way when I watch Mitch Marner killing a penalty. Yep. And the way the the, the you know the work ethic, the work rate the guy has. Um, you know, like, you know, the Zach Hyman's of the world are going to have to work out of their minds, right, in the mm-hmm. NHL because they don't have the talent level that those guys have. But they it's gotta, amazing. They got to figure out a way to sign him. Yeah, I don't. Like, it, they I, just, they just yeah, do. I to me, to, I don't know about you, but to me, he's a part of the core of this team. I consider him a part of the yeah, core of this team. Yeah, I do team. too. And I, and, and, like, I, look, I hope he gets every dollar he can oh, too, right? Get, get paid absolutely. while you can, son. And, absolutely. Uh, but in terms of the fit with this group, yeah, he's, you need a guy like him. You you know you need a guy like him who again works like crazy, and is willing to do the uh, the less glamorous stuff and makes whoever the two guys playing with him are better when he's with him. I don't care what line he's playing on. Right, uh, Jack Campbell we mentioned too, of course, <laughs> ten 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 games in a row. Uh, and I'm just reading Chris Johnson had a terrific article on Jack Campbell and sort of the emotional interview he did. With with Sean McKenzie after the game, that was great. By the way, oh, it was great. In the you know world, what? in this world of because again, you you and oh. I know how tough it is to interview people that way, right? It's yeah. not like sitting down in a cozy corner and actually having a conversation. It's really hard to get it right, and that one was tremendous. Yeah, and you know there are of course the people out there all the time. I mean, one of the talking points is why do you bother doing interviews with players between periods? Why do you bother doing them before the game? you know what is the value of player interviews that look a lot of them and it's not just hockey a lot of sports are tedious but every now and then you get that moment and that's why you do it 
you do it because of that moment. Yeah. Yeah. That's like, you know, there, there have been, there have been a few in this, a, you know, again, maybe they stand out more because everything else feels, a lot of it feels so distant, but, uh, and I love the thing with Matthews counting to 10. Yeah. That was, that was I'm sorry, uh, with Marner counting to 10. And Marner the ice after the game. Yeah, it was brilliant. It was, well, and it just shows you, like, how many, you know, we've heard a million times, everybody loves this guy, yeah. right? That Jack Campbell's very popular among his teammates. We've had a lot of people sing his praises as a person, you know, on this show and elsewhere. You've heard it. But that kind of stuff, you know, that's not for the show, right? They're not, that's not for the TV cameras. That's the, you know, I no, think that, guys exactly. honestly feel good for him. Yeah, that's not somebody saying in the middle of a Zoom call, we love the guy. You, know, you, you get those... You get those spontaneous displays of appreciation that um, – and, and, I, and I think the thing is there was such a – I'm not going to get modeling about it here, but that was kind of something that you could see two 12-year-old kids doing. Yeah. Two buddies. Yeah. You know, after, after a game. Yep. That's, 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 you know, that's in it, right? It, the, the team and play aspects of sport, yep. right? I don't think it goes away. No. I think no, you're you're right. It was it was real and it was spontaneous, and it you know kind of that that little bit of you know joie de vivre within a team. I think you know especially that year like this, it's got to matter. Right? Oh yeah, because it would be really easy to get the stink eye. I would think in uh, yeah, it in, could get pretty joyless pretty fast. I'm thinking yeah, this this would be we've talked about this. This would be a tough year to be a bad team. Oh, like I, it must seem the, long and it's just the, the longest ca- the year. The Calgary ever. Flames, this must be just the worst. You know, not for the Ottawa Senators. The Ottawa Senators are playing their ass off and they're leaving it all out on the ice every night. And I think they kind of enjoy being a team that could spoil. But can you imagine being or even a, a team like St. Louis or or, uh, or just Calgary? Just kind of. You're, oh. you're got to be just at a certain point just praying for it to end. Like yeah. just this, the, you know, I know it's a shortened season, but you wish it was shorter. Uh, the Leafs are 8 0 and one since Freddie Anderson went down last month. Jack Campbell has won his 10 starts. He's got a 944 save percentage. We mentioned that is a team record for the start of a career. And the man whose record he broke, Felix Potvin, will join us later on in the show. And uh, yeah, really, really well done to to Jack Campbell. It is, it's a it's a good story. It's it's still one of the best sports stories is the guy whose career never really amounted to what you thought it was going to amount to. And then all of a sudden, everything just clicks. Everything just falls in. And um, it's, 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 you know, if this season keeps going the way it does, Jack Campbell's going to have, he's not going to save a lot. He hasn't saved a lot of jobs, but Jack Campbell's made a lot of people's jobs a lot yes. easier. And if you're a Leaf fan, you should go light a candle oh, <laughs> and pray and for pray. his health. Absolutely. <laughs> you want, you need him healthy. Ren Lavoie is our NHL insider. He is with Tavia Sports. He'll join us next. We'll take a look back at the Leafs' 3-2 win over the Canadians, and uh, we'll talk about Jack Campbell. This is Writer's Block on Sportsnet 590, The Fan. and Angels, the Jays home opener tonight on Sportsnet 590. The Fan and Sportsnet Blue Jays Central. See at 6 p.m. on Sportsnet Ontario our radio pregame with Rob Wong, Josh Goldberg at 6.30 p.m. First pitch will be just after 7. Tabby and Buck with the call of the game and immediately following the game, Blue Jays talk with Wong and Goldberg right after the final out on Sportsnet 590. The Fan as the Three and three Jays take on Griffin Canning and the four and two Angels in Dunedin. We'll be joined in a few minutes from the ballpark by Daniel Kim, writer's block, Korean correspondent. Yeah, our guy, he's going to be, uh, but he's he is in Dunedin. He is in Dunedin. Just sent out a picture of uh, walking into the ballpark. So we'll, we'll get a sense from somebody on the scene as to uh, what that feels like. The... Toronto Maple Leafs are well. They've they've they spent this this pandemic season, I think, essentially checking boxes almost every every time they go out on the ice. And we talked about this a little bit before the break about just how 
is not just simply that they win games. It's the manner, the different manner in which they win games. It's the sense that they are, if not always in control, because there were times last night when Montreal was really, really good, but if not always in control, always seem to be in a position where they can seize control of the game. One of the best stories, of course, out of the least season so far has been the goaltending. It's been Jack Campbell, 10 wins in a row, a 944 save percentage. That is a club record beating Felix Potvin's old mark of nine consecutive wins to start a career. Let's bring in Ren Lavoie of Tavia Sports. Ren, thank you, as always, for doing this. Trust that you're keeping well and, and staying safe. Oh, uh, yeah. How surprised are you? Or how, let, let me rephrase that. How surprised do you think the NHL is at what Jack Campbell has done here, given, given what people thought of Jack Campbell early in his career? I imagine the, pe- the people in uh, L.A. or Dallas right now looking at him and say, hey, where, where that guy was uh, when he was obviously in our, playing for our, uh, our franchise. Uh, no, he's playing really well. Uh, the big difference for me is really for the first time in his career, he's playing for a really good team, right? Uh, he's involved. Uh, he's making uh, the key saves at the right time. But uh, honestly, uh, the team in front of him is uh, playing the right way. There's no other way to put it. I was, again, really impressed by the Toronto Maple Leafs last night. Uh, they, you know, they're playing a different hockey than last year. Uh, it's uh, in-your-face type of hockey. I'm not saying they're physical like, uh, you know, uh, a Western uh, conference team. I'm, I'm just saying that, you know, every time uh, uh, the Montreal Canadiens uh, had the puck, there was somebody on, on the player who had the, the puck quickly. There's no space on the ice. So they're really playing the right way. And, it, it, and obviously it helps uh, uh, goaltending uh, because... Yes, you have to make some key saves at times, but it's not complicated. Like, I, I don't remember myself saying last night, wow, the, the goaltending was the difference. No, I, I don't feel the goaltending was the difference, but it's a great story. Ren, when, when, the, in, when the Canadians took over that game in the second period, which they, yeah. uh, they did, what, what were they doing in that second period that allowed them to do that? And, you know, what did the Leafs do in the third to kind of, you know, turn the game back around? They played like the Leafs. They're supposed to, uh, you know, the, the Leafs played like they're supposed to in the third period. And I think in the second, uh, they uh, they decided to play a different type of game. Uh, and, and obviously, the Canadians took advantage. L- listen, it's not complicated right now. And there's an issue with the Montreal Canadiens. I feel it's a big one. They, they, they played um, Ottawa. Calgary and Toronto 16 times this year. They only have five wins versus those three, those three teams. And, and the big dif- difference for me is quite simple. They're playing an in-your-face type of hockey. Obviously, uh, the Toronto Maple Leafs uh, are way better than the Flames and the Ottawa Senators. But I'm just saying that the Montreal Canadiens, when they're playing a team who's forechecking the right way, uh, who's uh, quicker, on uh, on them uh, and they, they there's no space on the ice. The Canadians don't play well. That's the reality. Uh, and I, I feel that uh, yes, they played well in the second period. And in a way, I think people in Montreal are kind of saying, "Oh well, we played well in the second period. It's not that bad." Yes, it's bad. You're not winning versus the best team in the NHL right now, or uh, 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 obviously in the division. And I feel it's a, it's a problem, to be honest with you. I'm, I'm pretty sure that the, the Maple Leafs are feeling really good about themselves right now. Ren, I'm, I'm pretty certain folks in Montreal aren't feeling the same way about Alex Galchenyuk that folks in Dallas or L.A. would feel about Jack Campbell. Mm-hmm. But, but, I mean, he, look, he, he, it's, it's pretty clear that, that Sheldon Keefe has found some sort of use for him, isn't there? No doubt. Uh, he's playing well. Remember, we had a conversation about him, I I think, three weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And I said that if he's moving his feet, you know, that means that he's playing the right way and he's going to look like an NHL player. And it's exactly what we're seeing from the get-go. That's what I like about him. But, uh, you know, 
just pray that it, it, he's not going to go back to uh, who technically he is, a guy who doesn't want to be, want to be involved, who only want to play on the power play. No, I feel that right now, um, you know, the fact that he's playing on the second line, it's, it's really helping him. Uh, it shows confidence in him. And uh, I think that he, he knows he knows that it's working with the uh, Toronto Maple Leafs or he'll be out of the uh, out of this league next year. He won't, he won't play in the NHL if it's not working. That's quite simple. So I think he's a little scared. He's playing scared and he's playing the right way. And I'll say it's about time because the last time I saw him playing like that was his first year in the NHL. It's been a while, guys. Honestly, it's been a while. Yeah. Well, you know, and maybe, you know, maybe it finally clicks in that this is, you know, last chance, but last chance with a really good team too, right? He doesn't, yep. he doesn't have to carry it, you know, for this team. He just has to keep up. Exactly. And that's a big difference. But at the same time, you know, uh, you've seen uh, <laughs> so many players, um, you know, in the NHL coming in uh, and they, they think that they're playing the right way and they, they're not. And they, they're stubborn. Uh, most of them are not playing in the NHL. They're probably playing in the AHL. They, they can adjust their, their game. Uh, so he's smart enough to understand one thing. Uh, he needs to adjust, and that's what he's doing. One thing that uh, I've noticed, too, and some of my colleagues in Toronto are, are, are tweeting it, it's, uh, you know, he's, doing a, he's working really hard in practices. That's part of his DNA, by the way. Uh, he's, he's a hardworking player, but I, for any reason... During games, he's not. So it, it's tough to understand what's, uh, why exactly he was uh, not playing the right way uh, with the Ottawa Senators or the Dallas Stars or whoever he was playing before. It doesn't really matter. I said the Dallas Stars. I don't think he played there before. But anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, what I mean is he, he, he really struggled over the years. Uh, and I... I you know, I remember him playing for the Montreal Canadiens before he was straight to Arizona. I forgot about the Coyotes, the Coyotes instead of uh, the Dallas Stars. Uh, I remember that I, I was saying to one of my colleagues, I said, I've never seen a player, uh, you know, struggling so much af after his first season or second season in the NHL. The progression, there was not no progression in his game. Uh, it was going downhill. So now I feel like he's... He's, uh, he, he turned the page, and hopefully it's going to stay that way. Because if it stays that way, it makes the Toronto Maple Leafs a way better team, believe me. Ren, if you're, if you're Kyle Dubas heading towards the end of this trade deadline um, with a team that's playing as well as this one is, and with, a, you know, again, a lot of kind of interchangeable parts at yeah. forward. He has a lot of options at forward especially. What, what would you do? That's a great question. I mean, obviously I'm looking at Taylor Hall, and I, I wonder – I. You know, I talk to some people around the league, and they're all saying to me, Renault, don't look at Taylor Hall with what he's doing right now with the Buffalo Sabres. You need to understand that playing for the Sabres is really, really hard. Uh, you know, you don't want to you don't want to push too much because you wonder why you're pushing, and so it's it's kind of mental in a way. So um, I'm not saying the Toronto Maple Leafs needs to get a player like uh, Taylor Hall. If, if the offer on the table is something really interesting, that's, that could be a, you know, a great addition for the Leafs. I'm not saying it's not going gonna, it, gonna to happen, by the way, but I'm cur curious that is it the type of player that they're saying to themselves, if we get a player like him and there's not a lot of player like him available, uh, we're going to, it's not going to be only a one-two punch that we're going to have. We're going to have really three really good offensive lines. Yeah. Uh, so we'll see. But if 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 I was a Kyle Dubas, to be honest with you, I wouldn't do much personally. I'll, I'll go get some depth depth players um, because I feel that you know the more extra bodies that you have that you can put, in, in, you know, on the ice if, uh, if there's a need. Um, you know, it, it really does help. And you look at what the, uh, the Tampa Bay Lightning did. Even the Dallas Stars last year, they had a lot of players, a lot of players that can play. Uh, there was some injuries, obviously. So I, but I like, I like what they're doing right now. So I wouldn't 
personally, I wouldn't do much except, uh, you know, making sure that if I need another extra defenseman or an extra forward, that's, uh, you know, probably a, a seven or eight defenseman or or maybe another fourth line forward. I'll, I'll, I'll go and get that player, but not more than that. Ren, the relationship between Tom Fitzgerald uh, and Lou Lamorello intrigues me yeah. as part of this, This, you know, obviously the focal point of this deal with yeah. the Devils sending Kyle Palmieri and Travis Ajak to the, to the Islanders. There's an interesting quote uh, in the Associated Press story from Tom Fitzgerald talking about the trust that he and Lou have. And, you know, there, yeah. there's, I think sometimes... <laughs> You know, because maybe it's because of fantasy sports or, or whatever. Sometimes I think we we underestimate how important that human relationship is in making a trade. Right? There are reasons guys consistently trade with other general managers, isn't it? Yeah, no doubt. No, no doubt. And the word trust is really important here because the last thing that and when you talk to GMs around the league, I, I guess it's not like in the good old days. <laughs> When uh, you look at some GMs uh, asking another one to go fight after school or something like that, I think the relationship between the GMs changed. They don't want to. They, they want to make sure that both parties are going to be satisfied uh, with uh, you know the trade that they just uh, they just made. And I think that if you look at uh, Lula Moriello, he's doing again a great job with the Islanders. Uh, Yes, it's a great trade uh, because to get Paul Mary is one thing, but Travis Zajac last year didn't want to waive his no-movement clause to go to uh, the Islanders. That, by the way, shocked a lot of people uh, in the uh, Devils organization at the time, wondering uh, why you don't want to go play in the playoffs. What kind of player are you? Why are you doing something like that? But at the same time, you wanted to stay. Uh, with the Devils, especially being traded to, from the Devils to the Islanders, what not was not the end of the world. It's not like uh, you're changing uh, you're changing state, but you're not uh, you're not changing a country, or you're not going to play uh, in Chicago. It's really close. So, uh, but anyhow, um, it's uh, it's an unbelievable move. Um, I think uh, Paul Mary's got a lot of give again. Travis uh, Zajac, there's some question marks about his game, but I feel like if he uh, if he can go play again in the playoffs, uh, we're going to find a different player. So, yes, the trust level between the GMs is really, really important. Uh, but I, I do believe that, that um, you know, Lou was really aggressive even last year, for sure, with Travis Zajac and maybe probably with uh, Paul Mary, but who knows. Ren, what's, what's Mark Bergevin going to try and get accomplished as, uh, by the deadline? Well, now uh, things change because, yeah. um, you know, a week ago, I would have said that he would have uh, tried to uh, maybe trade one of his player uh, to another team. So uh, money in, money out, like he, uh, he likes to say. Uh, but now he's got some cap relief because of the uh, uh, Brandon Gallagher injury. Um, so that's going to really help him. Uh, probably that he really only wanted to make only one move, right? Maybe get a forward, a fourth line forward forward a guy who uh, won the cup maybe before uh, or maybe another depth at the blue uh, depth player at the blue line now i feel he can do both so i I think he's got a plan Um, part of the plan is quite simple he wants to get players who won the stanley cup before that's one of the reasons eric stahl is now playing for the montreal canadians they needed obviously uh, uh, an experienced sentiment uh, to help Philip Deneau. Uh, so that that changed a lot. Uh, you know uh, how how uh, the, the Canes are are going to play during the the playoffs. So I think it's it's going to be a tougher team because of uh, Eric Stahl coming in, uh, especially uh, between the dots. But that being said, listen, um, I, I believe that he's really looking to get maybe a heavier player, especially up front. A guy that's not going to be pushed around. I'm not saying a, a, a Nicolas Delorier type of player. I'm not talking about, uh, you know, a, a guy who likes to drop the gloves. I'm just saying a guy that's going to make sure that it's going to be tougher to play versus the Montreal Canadiens because right now you look at the fourth line. Uh, I don't think that anybody's really scared. Mm-hmm. 
Ren, really good of you to do this as always. Stay safe. Yeah, I will. You too, and enjoy your weekend. Thank you very much. That is Ren Lavoie, NHL insider with Tavia Sports. And uh, Mark Bergevin among, uh, well, a lot of general managers in this this division have some decisions to make. And it, it is kind of funny because he, you you do get the sense that, that, and this often does happen, I'm looking at almost every team in this division, Stephen, mm-hmm. I think, has given their general manager a lot of food for thought. Like, I, I don't think there's a team in this division that's kind of general managers looking at it and going, yeah, you know, kind no. of. Well, like, like, you know, like take Vancouver out of the equation because right. God knows, right, like where they're going to be in a week and right. what their options are going to be. And it's, you know, that's that's one for the, you know, that's one for 2021. But um, Ottawa's been, it's been a, it's probably been the perfect season for them. Yep, encouraging, but you know, uh, progress, but yep. still a lot of, and they have some pieces they can move. Calgary is, you know, that's the really interesting one to me because, you know, what they made the coaching change, they made a commitment to Sutter to come in there. It has not worked. Mm-hmm. Um, they've got some, you know, they've got some guys who are not going to coexist with Sutter. I don't think down the road. If you're Brad Truliving, you've got to know what your team is right now. Well, I mean, you really do. I don't know if you, yeah. Well, I think. I think you know, but put it this way: you know who your coach is, and you've made, and you right. said it's it's him and uh, his way or the highway, and he's going to be here for a while. So you now have to build a team for him. And if guys have shown you already that they are not going to work for him, or Daryl Sutter's gone to Brad Trilliving and said this ain't going to work, um, yeah, he's the the, the the equation changes there with the coaching change because it's not just another guy. He's not, and they've, look, they've gone through a lot of coaches there too, but you know, Daryl Sutter's not disposable. So you've you know the die is cast. You've you've got to give him what he wants now, or try to give him what he wants. And if he's soured on guys, and there's every reason to believe he has, then you know you know don't have to move him now. They might want to move some of them in the off season when there's a bigger market. But uh, that team's going to get blown up. I think that's pretty clear. Yeah, I think that's that's absolutely clear. Daniel Kim is uh, ESPN's Korean baseball insider. Uh, he is also uh, the lead voice on DKTV. Uh, we've, we're lucky enough to strike up a bit of a relationship with Daniel in, in spring training last year. Uh, he is uh, covering Hyunjin Ryu. He's in Dunedin for today's Blue Jays home opener. Daniel Kim joins us next. This is Writer's Block on Sportsnet 590, The Fan. Seven o'clock is the first pitch tonight. The Jays taking on the Los Angeles Angels in their home opener at TD Ballpark in Dunedin in front of 19, 1900 and some fans. It was funny. We had uh, uh, Mark Goobs on yesterday, the Angels analyst, and uh, he was talking about Dunedin and saying, yeah, I remember. I remember spring training in Dunedin, you know, back in the old stadium. And I'm thinking, Where the hell would you have done that? And then I remembered the Kansas City Royals, who are now in Arizona. Do you remember baseball and boardwalk and baseball? Kane City, which is yeah, right in the middle of of a whole bunch of interstates between Orlando and Lakeland and yeah. Dunedin. It, they, they, it was like a, it was like a fairground. It wasn't a fairground. It was like an amusement park, and they had a ballpark there. And it was called Boardwalk and Baseball, and there was like a, a Ferris wheel. Jesus, you know, and I was. I do remember them being in the Grapefruit League, uh, you know, and being you know later, late, later comers to uh, the Cactus yeah. League, right? But yeah, I do. But I didn't know that's where they were. I, 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 I think remember I ever went there. My first and only interview with 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 Bo Jackson. Yeah. When I and and as as a as a young reporter starting out. My first and only interview with Bo Jackson, and George Brett was there as well. And when I was younger, I was not always that in, as intimidated as I should have been interviewing guys. There are some athletes you should be intimidated by. Bo Jackson was one of those guys. I was. He wasn't the friendliest interview. He was. You know what? I think it's because, and I know we have Daniel Kim with us. George Brett was off to the side. And heard me introduce myself from Montreal. A true story. And George Brett said, Montreal, Chez Paris. 
And I said, why, yes, as a matter of fact, Shea Puri. So he started talking to him, and then that kind of warmed things up a little bit with Bo Jackson. It was, it was a good interview. Bo was fine. He gave, yeah. me, gave me like he was shy. Like, he's talked about it, right? That he had some kind of yeah, he's he, had he, issues, right? Yeah, right. he wasn't like it wasn't in depth. He wasn't you know reciting. Yeah, it wasn't Shakespeare, but from for a reporter's point of view, exactly what I needed. By the way, Shay, uh, Shay's uh, Shay's story up. Shay, 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 Shay. I'm sure Shay's never been to Shay. Uh, Shay Davidi's story on uh, Sportsnet.ca indicating that the Buffalo Bisons will move to New Jersey to play ah. out their schedule, um, so that the Blue Jays presumably can move into Salem Field. There you go. So uh, the Buffalo Bi- uh, Buffalo Bisons will be in New Jersey. The Jays would be, and and that. You know, that's maybe not as draconian as it sounds because the AAA season's going to end, I believe, in August anyhow. Yeah. And we've been saying, I think, the earliest you'd see the Jays in Toronto right now is probably September. So it doesn't sound as if I wouldn't go reading a whole bunch into that. No, right it's just, I, just, I guess there was speculation they might play in Rochester, which, uh, it's, yes. so that's the only change there as far as I can see. Uh, let's bring in Daniel Kim, our very good friend. Mr. Kim, how are you doing? Gentlemen, happy opening day. Happy yeah. opening day. What what is what is opening day like in Dunedin? I, I've never I've never experienced that. Well, uh none of us have uh <laughs> major league baseball opening day in Dunedin. Uh this is something that uh, doesn't happen quite often, but I got here about twenty minutes ago. Uh they're not letting us inside the stadium yet. We are still we've got more three more than three hours to go before game time, so I haven't seen any fans near the stadium. But uh, it's a beautiful day. I think it's going to get cooler later at night for first pitch. But uh, it's uh, definitely excited to be here, and uh, I'm curious to see how everything's going to uh, play out tonight. What are what are the rules for for the uh, media there, uh, Daniel? Like what are you where, what are you going to be allowed to do and not do? Um, well, I'm going to find out once I get inside the stadium, but I know that uh, I had to take a, uh, an online uh, screening test before I came here just to make sure that I'm healthy, that I don't have any high temperatures, any symptoms. So I had to do that before I left the, uh, left the house. And I got, got an approval uh, from, uh, I got an approval email that I could uh, come to the stadium and then um, so exactly uh, what kind of uh, coverage I'm allowed to um, uh, do today, uh, I'm going to find out once I get inside the stadium. But I'm sure there are going to be some restrictions, but I'm just glad to be able to uh, be in a stadium with some fans and see a Major League Baseball game. You know, Daniel, we've seen now uh, Hyunjin Ryu make two starts, uh, work deep into games, deeper at least than 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 last year. It seems as if the Blue Jays uh, you know, are, are probably... Uh, I, I think they're they're probably going to treat him a little more this year the way he was he was treated uh, the way he was treated in L.A. How interested are you in seeing how the Jays let this play out because they're in the middle of a run of sixteen games sixteen games in a row and we know that in the past the extra day has sometimes helped Hyunjin Ryu. Uh, how, how do you think they're going to play this out? Are they just going to keep him on a regular on a regular turn? Or do you think they may try to squeeze an extra day in there? Well, I think they would like to give him uh, extra days if they, uh, if it's possible. But one thing that I want to point out uh, from what's different this year is that Hyunjin went through a very routine-based, uh, very uh, controlled spring training. Mm-hmm. Compared to last year, everything got stopped in the middle. They were in Toronto for a couple of weeks, came to Buffalo. So everything was kind of, um, I guess, difficult for him to uh get ready for the season. So because the Hyunjin had a, uh, just a normal, regular, uninterrupted spring training, I think um, they, he's on track to make 30-plus starts. Um, if there's an opportunity for him, them to give him an extra day off and here and there, I think they will. But I think the plan is to just play out the season as much as, uh, uh, as, as, much as he can right now. What did what did you see through those his first two starts, Daniel? He looks he, he looks extra. If nothing else, he looks extraordinarily comfortable. Yeah, he looked def- definitely comfortable. Remember last year, his couple of two starts weren't all that great. I think uh, he admitted to us later after uh, he came back to Korea that he was a little bit nervous 
about a couple, uh, first a couple of starts last season. I think um, you know he came in with a big contract, and I think that he wanted to kind of show immediately that uh, he is worth the contract that he got. So I think he was pressing that a little bit, which is very very rare for Hyunjin. But this season, completely different picture. He uh, he genuinely it seems like enjoys being part of the Blue Jays team. And one thing that I also have to bring up is his relationship with Danny Jansen, uh, especially during games, has gotten so much better. They're on pretty much uh, one page right now. I asked him about that, and uh, he feels that Sunday feels that Danny Jansen knows uh, 95% of the time which pitches he he wants to throw. So uh, I think last year was a, a good step forward for Sunday as a member of the Blue Jays, and I think uh, he's just really comfortable right now. Yeah, it was uh, noticeable in the first start in particular that there was much less or much more shaking off than there was last year. Daniel, thank you so much for doing this. Stay safe. Enjoy the game. Thanks, guys. Uh, it's happy to be here. I hope the uh, Blue Jays have put together a really good season. Yes, thank you, my friend. Be well. Daniel Kim. Yes, uh, I, I wish he was ESPN. here or we were there. KBO. <laughs> I'd take either. The Jays' starting lineup is out, by the way. Uh, Semyon is leading off in DHing. Biggio at third, Bichette at short, Hernandez in right, Guerrero at first, Gurriel Jr. in left, Grichik in center, Panic at second, Jansen behind the plate, stripling on the mound. So Rowdy Telez grabbing some pine, despite the fact that uh, there is a right-handed, a, a right-handed pitcher in the mound. And you know, we talked about it a little bit when you came in the room here. My two concerns at this team right now are Kevin Biggio and Rowdy Telez. They would be my one and my two as well. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. David Sampson will join us next. This is Writer's Block. You're listening to Writer's Block with Jeff Blair, Stephen Brunt, and Richard Deitch on the Sportsnet Radio Network. Welcome to home opening day, such as it is. The Jays will take on the Los Angeles Angels. It's nice. Don't call them the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim anymore. Just call them Los Angeles Angels. Tonight in Dunedin in front of 19... Is 1960 the magic number? Is that right? Is that what it is? I, I believe they've they've upped the uh, the number of tickets that are being made available for the game. Um, and I don't know why, but the number 1960 is just kind of emblazoned in my sort of rapidly shrinking brain. Anyhow, it'll be uh, Griffin Canning on the mound for the Angels, Ross Stripling for the Blue Jays, and uh, as you know, I heard in the update, Rowdy Telez. Uh, if you had Rowdy Telez being benched on your bingo card, your Blue Jays bingo card for the first week of the season, congratulations. That has uh, that has occurred. Joe Panic is at second base. Marcus Semyon is DHing. Vladdy is at first, and uh, Rowdy Tellez is grabbing some grabbing some pine. Um, we haven't had a uh, David Sampson on since Major League Baseball made. I don't think we have since Major League Baseball announced that it was moving the All Star Game from Atlanta to, as it turns out, Denver. Uh, <sighs> I, I still haven't decided whether I'm surprised by the by the decision. It makes it makes a lot to me. It makes a great deal of sense. Well, first of all, on the moral on moral grounds, it makes sense. But also, I just I, I cannot imagine Rob Manfred wanted players having to answer questions at the media availability. Why are you here? Or put players in a position where they'd have to decide whether or not to go. It just doesn't seem to me to make a great deal of sense. I. I the more I thought about it, the more I realized I think it was just an obvious decision. We'll bring in David Sampson, host of Nothing Personal with David Sampson, the podcast. Look, David, thank you so much for for doing this. I've heard some of your your comments, some of the things you said about this decision. Um, and look, I you know I, I'd like to think that it's because Rob Manfred is very altruistic and just wants to do the right thing. But there were some there were a lot of layers that went into this decision, weren't there? Yeah, you can't make a decision to pull an all-star game based on politics without thinking about the ripple effect. 
And Rob was certainly aware that there'd be people both in favor and against what he did. Uh, I think that's the rule in media, right? Don't be political because you'll alienate 50 percent of your audience. So I think that that is uh, something that Rob thought about. But in this case, he just didn't have a choice. The players pushed his hand and they basically said, we're not going to play in Atlanta and you're going to have an all-star game without all-stars. And Rob decided that it just wasn't worth it. The fight wasn't worth it. And uh, this way he could do the right thing in his mind by pulling the game, but also protect the players by not saying it was because of the players not showing up and maybe try to gain an ounce of improved relations before collective bargaining. What do you think the discussion would have been like between Rob and the owners, given the politics of some of those owners? You know, there's some big Republican donors among that group who um, would have fought this tooth and nail, you know, if it, if it was a philosophical decision, you know, a, a political decision, you know, an economic decision might be something else uh, and, you know, real world politics and, you know, the real world of collective bargaining to come, et cetera. But how, how do you think Manfred would have dealt with those people or had to deal with those people? Well, he's different than Bud Selig, the previous commissioner who wanted a 30 to nothing vote, everything he did. Uh, Rob Manfred's pretty good at getting 23 to 7 and being okay with it, which is the magic number to get anything done in baseball. But in this case, what, what, what struck me is how public certain owners got, including the Braves, who had to make a statement. And I think MLB was aware that they were going to do that and worked with them to time the statements out. But then Ken Kendrick, who is a known Republican, had some things to say publicly as well about the decision. And I, I don't recall seeing that when Bud was commissioner. I know there'd be a lot of internal conversations between owners and Bud, but really people didn't go public against Bud. And that was a, a striking thing. But Kendrick's been against Rob. We couldn't get him to vote for Rob when Rob ran for commissioner. So uh, he's always not really been a fan of Rob. But it was that that did surprise me. So, uh, you know, I, of course, immediately I would, w when this decision was made, uh, you know, one of the things pa uh, Passon and I were, were talking about, we were texting, is I said, well, I'm waiting for the uh, whole, you know, the, 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 uh, the whole, uh, uh, what do you call it? I always, I always lose my train of thought. The uh, monopoly, anti-monopoly thing, Stephen. Yeah, the, the antitrust. Yeah, that thank trust. you. Yeah, I, I'm waiting. I'm, I, I said, well, I'm waiting for the whole anti, somebody to say that they're going to go after the antitrust exemption. And of course, just like clockwork, took about South, an hour. Took him an hour. South Carolina, uh, South Carolina uh, uh, congressman said that they are going after the antitrust exem exemption. Does baseball? Does that scare baseball anymore? So there's. Uh, they've been trying to go after the antitrust exemption for as long as the antitrust exemption has existed. Basically, just to sum it up, it allows baseball, in very simple terms, allows baseball to act as though they're a monopoly when they're not. Mm -hmm. And it allows them to do certain things that they otherwise wouldn't be able to do legally. That's what an antitrust exemption gives you. And it's granted through the court and through a decision from many, many, many years ago, many decades ago. And there are a lot of people, a lot of Republicans, including Ted Cruz and Marco Rubio and Mike Lee and various people down here who are trying to go after that exemption really as a sword by saying, hey, MLB, you did something anti-Republican by taking the All-Star game out of Florida, then we're going to take away your antitrust exemption. We'll show you not to be anti-Republican. And that's been going on for so long. I don't think baseball spends five minutes on it, but I do know that they've got uh, enough connections in Washington and they've got enough business they do in Washington that there are not the votes baseball believes, and I don't either, to – have a legislative change to what the judicial branch has ruled in this instance. No, and again, well, and again, it's like it's like opposites world, yeah, uh, David. Like, <laughs> you know, like, like you know, the, the 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 fact that the Republicans are arguing to lift the antitrust exemption, like it's you know where that, they've just you know crossed sides here, essentially historically on 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 you know how how the two parties view the antitrust exemption. But um, if Rob had come out and said, "I am in favor of what happened in Georgia," we're so excited to go to Atlanta then in my opinion, the Democrats would have gone after yeah. the exemption. Yeah, probably, it's, it's right? Like, yeah, it's, so it's not, I, again, I'm not sure what anybody believes anymore or believes in anymore, but um, I, I think that, yeah, the, the, it's, it's an easy thing to bandy about. Of course, one of, the, one of the arguments made or one of the explanations for why baseball was anxious to put a team back in D.C., was to cover off that possibility as well, wasn't it? That, that's, you know, that you, it's, it's a great place to... You know, have uh, have senators and and members of Congress show up and and watch baseball and be happy about it. wasn't Wasn't that part of the rationale for putting a team back there? 
that certainly was part of it, but it was also the best market for the Expos to move to. And it was the market that was willing to build a stadium. And it was a market where they had a bunch of owners, a bunch of potential owners bidding it to, to pay a very high price at that time for a franchise. But whenever we went to Nationals games, there were always politicians around the ballpark. Uh, no question about that. And, and baseball has been very involved politically. There's something called the Washington Business Forum that I was a part of where you have meals and and you are speaking with members of, of the House and, and, and people in the Senate, Congress, et cetera, and both sides of the aisle. Because when you're, when you're a sport like baseball or like most businesses, you'll notice that the majority uh, support both candidates who are Republican and Democratic because you can't be subject to the whims of the voter. You have to make sure that you have the winning horse. Yeah, I think if I'm not mistaken, wasn't Kent Conrad, the former uh, governor of North Dakota or senator from North Dakota, he was actually a lobbyist for baseball, is he not? No, Ken Conrad's wife, Lucy Kaluti, was a that's lobbyist. Who for it was. Close okay. enough. Okay, close enough. <laughs> right. Ken the Conrad. person that slept with Ken Conrad. That is a great memory. A quick Ken Conrad story. He and I switched jobs for a day. He always wanted to be president of a team, and I always wanted to be a senator. So he was president for a day, and I was a senator for a day. And I spent the day with him in Washington, and he spent the day with me in, in Florida. And we had an interesting time. It's just funny, right? Rock yeah. stars want to be actors and baseball players, and athletes want to be rock stars. I always wanted to be a senator. And uh, he was a smart, he is a smart, very smart man, frustrated by what goes on in Washington, but a smart, good man. So you were the, you were for at least temporarily a senator for the great state of North Dakota. Uh, which means that I had a meal in the senator's dining room <laughs> and I got to sit in on a couple of meetings and I got to take a U.S. Senate ashtray, which I put <laughs> underneath my shirt. <laughs> that is awesome. Uh, hey, hey, David, you know, uh, Going into the season, obviously, there's a lot of focus on pitching, pitching injuries, increased pitching workload, et cetera, et cetera. Everybody was trying to figure out how to, you know, square the circle. And through six days, it's like every day I go on now, I see another position player going on the IL. You know, Tim Anderson, uh, Kettle Marte, George Springer. Aaron Judge. Aaron Judge with general soreness five games into the season. General soreness, which is, you know, something I wake up with every day as I, as I was saying today how much of this is how much how much of this do you think is is maybe major league teams being I'm not going to say overcautious but being really aggressive when it comes to ensuring that any little injury is taken care of right away because this is going to be a different year compared to last year yeah, I was surprised. Let's just talk about Aaron Judge for a minute. I didn't see why Aaron Boone had to say anything other than a day off. Uh, and the media would then speculate why he needed a day off five days into the season. I don't think there was a reason to say general soreness because you really don't have to say anything to the media at all about any injury unless you put a player on the injured list. And we would, when we had injured players who we knew were unavailable to play that night, we wouldn't say a word to anyone because let the opposing team think that there's a chance that Aaron Judge could pinch hit, or mm-hmm. there's a chance that our pitcher could, our closer could pitch for an unprecedented seventh day in a row, right? So, so don't take the mystery out of it. But Aaron Boone saying that worried me because for, we would never tell the media about general soreness. Everybody's got general soreness. If you ask any player any time of year, they're always sore with something or their body's bruised or they're feeling a little fatigued. So I, I was concerned about that. We'll see how quickly he comes back. And in terms of the, the injuries, I did a whole segment on that on today's Nothing Personal, actually. So it's funny you bring it up. I led with that because it's the nightmare of any executive. The fact that all these players are getting hurt this early when that's the one thing you want to try to protect against, knowing that you're playing 162 instead of 60 this year. And you know you're going to have injuries late in the season. The last thing you want are injuries early in the season, and they seem to be rampant. Yeah, and it's but you know pitchers got to pitch though, right? Like like you know James Paxton came out after 24 pitches, right? Like I like so much like and some of these are you know like it's again it's not like anybody is getting hurt because of no, but it's more the po- it's more the position player injuries yeah. that are of a concern. I yeah, think more than right now. Well, there's been a lot of pitchers too, but but you're right. Yeah, the 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 I, I think Jeff's theory though on the on the position players is right. David, that they may be babying some of these guys along, you know, because they're hyper aware of 162 after 60. And, you know, even though we had a normal spring training there, you know, there may be kind of, you know, heightened sensitivities to, you know, aches and pains and muscle pulls. Yeah. I think the GMs are aware that there's going to be issues later in the season when they get to three, 400 at bats and they're, they're seeing it a little earlier than they'd like. 
And I think it's not that they're babying them. I think that they're just more apt to rest them. You know, in the NBA, we call it load management, right? Mm-hmm. That was never a thing. Jack McKeon did. It used to be called the Sunday lineup. You remember that, Jeff? That expression? Yep. Who's the Sunday lineup? Well, Jack McKeon didn't believe in a Sunday lineup. He just played players until they couldn't walk anymore. But more and more these days, there's analytics on when players should sit. If a player comes in and says he didn't sleep well, then you're more apt to not play him or you know, monitoring all sorts of, of, of nutrition and how they're feeling. And plus, you also don't know which players are getting vaccinated. And it's possible after players get vaccinated, they don't want to play for a day, sometimes mm-hmm. two, and then they lose their strength and they got to get strength back after a day or two. So I'm taking everything with a grain of salt that I'm reading from managers and from GMs right now, because unless it includes a stop on the IL where you have to miss 10 days, then I'm not believing anything that I read. Do you think there will be any team that won't hit the 85 percent threshold for vaccinations and the loosening of restrictions? No, it'll be 30 to zero. Okay, Including tier two employees. It'll be tier one, tier two, meaning not just players, coaches and staff but also front office and those who would have any access to the clubhouse, whether it be barbers or clubbies, any, any, anybody. I think 85% is low uh, in my mind. I understand why it was chosen, but uh, I think the number will end up being higher. What did you, we, you know, we obviously watched the Jays, you know, kick off the, uh, with the home opener in Texas with a full, well, near full house, but uh, with the ability to sell all those tickets um, and watching that kind of mostly maskless crowd. And again, I know a, Thousands of those people may well be vaccinated, uh, but it was it was a strange experience watching it, David. Um, just because it's been so long and and uh, we're so far from that here uh, right now. What what do what did you think watching you know a full stadium for the first time in a year? I couldn't help but think about politics and that that state. You know, if if Florida could do it, they would do it. If the Marlins could do it, I think they they chose not to. But I know that the governor here would say no problem, full house. Texas is trying to make up for a full year of no revenue because they opened a new ballpark in front of no fans. And that is a major problem for them. And they ended up having to trade a bunch of players and their team is not very good. And and you feel badly for them because they planned this 2020 season for years and years and years. And then COVID happens. So given that they were allowed to do it, I'm not surprised that they did. But in terms of how strange it was for me, it felt normal because I was able to trick my brain into thinking that's how it's always looked. You know, and look, so I'm trying to forget sort of what it looks like when there's 5,000 people in the stands or nobody. Right. You know, the, one of the other things uh, that I, stories that interested me, and I laughed when I saw you. I didn't laugh because I, I, I was intrigued by what you said on Twitter. When the Marlins announced that they got naming rights, they sold naming rights to, to, to the ballpark. I uh, was at Lone Depot Bank or Lone Depot Park. You made a, a comment I hadn't thought of. You said that you'd always tried to sign naming rights, but you set a budget And if you didn't reach that figure, you wouldn't sell it because once you sell, I'm paraphrasing you, I think once you sell naming rights, you've kind of established the market. Is that, could you maybe go into a little more detail on that? So we did a budget for every piece of signage that was available uh, at Marlins Park. And the budget for naming rights was $10 million. And you can get $10 million for naming rights anytime you want by giving inventory. So you can give a bunch of outfield signs because those cost money. And if you make them part of the deal, then that counts. If you can give them eight seats behind the plate, that's another half a million dollars. You can give them a suite, that's another half a million dollars. And all of a sudden, the naming rights portion of your deal is only $6 million because they've gotten $4 million worth of other stuff. My view was that if we give away too much stuff, we won't have what we need to sell to hit the revenue numbers that we need to hit in order to do our meet our projections. So I was never willing to take less and I could never get a deal because the most I would get was with Pepsi, who was willing to go to, you know, eight million dollars. But I realized that if we do that deal for 10 years, then I'm losing two million a year for 10 years. Right. And the answer that people give me is, isn't it better to get eight versus 10? Well, I had a long talk versus eight versus zero, I should say, because if I could have done a deal for eight. Instead, I do no deal waiting for 10. Well, I had a talk with uh, Mr. Ted Lerner, who happens to own the Washington Nationals, Mm -hmm. who happened to play in Nationals Park. And his view, his budget was a naming rights deal of $20 million. And he hadn't gotten it. And I asked him to give me advice and tell me what his thoughts were. He said, David, you only get to sell it for the first time once. And if you go off your price, and and he's a real estate guy, he was talking about real estate. 
And he said, if you lower your price, then what you're telling everyone in the market who is a buyer is that all they have to do is wait and they, and you will lower your price. And he said, you do not want people thinking that. So he'd rather take zero than not get 20. And I followed his point of view because he's a pretty successful man. And, uh, it didn't work for me only because I got fired before I could do a naming rights deal. And I'm, I'm thankful that, that there's one done in Florida because it's good for the game. It's a company that's doing business with baseball uh, on the national side. They're the sponsor of the ALCS and NLCS. So it's a pretty natural fit. David, I know, I know you talked about the, uh, the Astros players, the Astros facing fans really for the first time since the science stealing scandal, because fans mm-hmm. are coming back obviously on the, on your podcast. Um, but I, I wonder just, it, well, we've got you here. Um, you know, it, it is it is an interesting moment. It feels like a million years ago in some ways, but um, you know, but it is the it is the it is the first kind of opportunity for fans to voice their feelings about that. We're going to be dealing with it at some point with George Springer as a Blue Jay potentially facing. Well, he hasn't faced any fans yet because he hasn't played, but um, on the road, but eventually in Toronto with the home fans here. Uh, the, the, the fan base that was probably most up in arms, the Dodgers fans, well, you know, they won a World Series in the interim. Maybe they're not quite as angry as they were. But um, what do you think this, you know, the recrimination tour is going to be like for the Astros? I think it's what's going to propel them all the way to the playoffs. And uh, they're going to play the role of the villain, and they're happy to do it. As clubhouses like that, I was telling someone else on another show that there's nothing like winning on the road. There's nothing like quieting down a a sold-out crowd who's booing you. Players love that. Executives love that. And I think that Houston's fine. There's enough separation now between when they did it and today that it's not really in the front of their mind. It's not as raw as it was at the beginning of last season, the way it it is uh, then, as you recall. That's all we were talking about. I came on your show four times to talk about garbage cans sign stealing and then time passes and people get a little more calm and now it's sort of another blip because there's some booing and there's some trash can banging but the truth is within baseball and certainly within that clubhouse uh they've all moved well on from that how much do you think having dusty as manager has helped that because look i've dealt with dusty an awful lot through the years i i i would have to be I mean, I'd have to have one foot in hell to be really nasty to Dusty and ask him a, na- a nasty question. I mean, I, I just would. And, and I'm wondering if maybe that you think maybe having a guy like Dusty there as the front, front-facing guy with this has helped because he, he does have a huge amount of currency in the game. I thought it would help until I saw what he said mm. and I was disappointed in what he said because it showed a little bit of tone deafness. And he said, hey, who doesn't live in a glass house? I wish everyone would just be quiet because who's never done anything wrong? And I think that what people really want is just the ability to boo. And what they're booing is their lives in COVID, right? They're booing the fact that uh, it's just been a tough year for everybody, a tough year and a half. And if you're the Astros, I think you let people boo. You let people yell and you show contrition and that's it. You don't talk about how people shouldn't boo me or shouldn't boo them. And I just think Dusty took the wrong tone. But Dusty's a great person, obviously, and a great manager. Mm -hmm. But he's in a terrible position. He wasn't even there. He shouldn't have to answer for this. He shouldn't have to talk about it. And the Astros shouldn't have him talk about it. Because people want to hear when A.J. Hinch spoke as the new manager of the Tigers, people 